it's great to see such a large amount of people exiting for their kids' classrooms. And the kids did a great job this morning. I was having to make multiple trips in and out of the auditorium, and I think I had about eight bulletins by the time I was done <laughs> doing that. They're great volunteers. Um, earlier this year, I was having a conversation in the lobby, and I was chatting with some good friends of ours, Ruth and Randy, and one of the things that we have in common is we're both parents of kids uh, who attend North Star Christian School, and I help do some coaching. I, I assist Randy with the track team and stuff. And so we enjoy catching up on Sundays, and uh, like with a lot of couples, we'll just, you'll end up standing in a circle with a cup of coffee and, and catching up on things. And this one morning, uh, it was shortly, it was about a week after a school break, and Randy was sharing uh, something that had happened at North Star. And at some point, either just before break or during break, uh, someone had come into the school and did a little prank. And the kids, at the beginning of the year, all of the junior high and high school students, they get their locker combination and they'll go to their lockers. And they've discovered that if you take a pencil, when you open up your locker, you can, you can insert a pencil in there so that when the lock comes down, it doesn't go down all the way, your locker will still close, but you don't have to do the combination every time you come during, during your break between classes. And so a lot of the kids do this. It gives them more time to chat in between classes. And so someone had gone through and pulled out all of the pencils <laughs> for every single locker that had this done. And when the kids came back from break, this was well into the school year, uh, they came back and they hadn't done their combination since the first couple days of school. <laughs> so no one knew their combination and could not get into their locker. And so there's this line of students heading down to the office having to have their combination written down again. Well, as Randy's telling me the story, I see my son Jake standing next to Randy and he has this little smirk on his face. And the further he goes into the story, it just grows into this smile and gets bigger and bigger. And I realize in that moment who the person was <laughs> who pulled out all of the pencils. <laughs> and it's moments like that, I was, I was talking about this with Amy, like, as a parent, is, is that something that we punish Jake for, or do we high-five him? Because that, that was good. <laughs> it was really good. And there's... A lot of challenging questions that we face as parents, that we face in general, there's, there's tough questions like that and tensions that we face in our Christian walk as well. And one of the questions I want to talk about this morning that I think is, is challenging is, is how do we live our faith, how do we live out our faith in a way that impacts our world while still protecting ourselves from the world? I think that's a tough thing to figure out. It would be nice if, if we had some sort of list of all the scenarios that we would face in life, and we could just kind of scan through li this list and find out, oh, here's, here's what I'm facing right now. Here's exactly what I should do. Now, the problem with a list like that it would, is it would be absolutely enormous, and it probably still wouldn't contain all the situations that we're going to face. And the other issue with that is it would feel like just a bunch of rules. And I think our relationship, our faith walk, is, is more about relationship, not rules. And so a list like that wouldn't work. But I want to take a look at a, a passage in Scripture this morning that I think will be really helpful in kind of diving into that tension. And so we're going to jump into the book of Luke this morning. There's this story of when Jesus heals a leper. And we find this uh, in several of the Gospels, but we're going to look at Luke this morning. And it's in Luke chapter 5. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus offered him or ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded your cleansing, for your cleansing, as a testimony to them. So, this healing of the leper is a pretty big deal. And 
I would love to have been there to actually witness this because I think it would be extraordinary to watch. I've, I've experienced several people in my life who have been healed from something, and most of the time it, it looks something like uh, a family member or a friend sharing that they have some sort of illness, uh, maybe they have cancer, and they had gone to the doctor and they, and they have this terrible news. And then uh, they're just surrounded by family and friends who pray for them. And then they go back for a follow-up visit and the test re results come back and they're completely different. And either the cancer is totally gone or it has gone down so much and the doctors are baffled. They're, they're like, this just doesn't happen. This is amazing. And those are the types of healings that I've experienced. But in this situation, we have this man who's covered with skin diseases all over his body, very prominent, and when Jesus touches him, they're instantly gone. I think that would be amazing to watch. Um, but I think this healing is actually an even bigger deal than what we see here. And to understand how amazing this healing is, uh, we need to understand the framework that a person in this culture would have grown up in. And to understand that, uh, Jesus kind of alludes to this when he, when he gives the command, go and offer your sacrifices at the temple to the priests. And this comes from the book of Leviticus. And according to early scholars, um, Leviticus would be the very first book that would be taught to children. And if you could sum up the book of Leviticus in one word, it would be holiness. The book of Leviticus is about God's will and his character and how to live out holiness in your everyday life. And so uh, scholars or Jewish teachers thought that this was of utmost important and, and the most important thing to teach kids as they grow up. Now, I don't know about you if you've ever done a Bible reading plan and, and been determined to read through the Bible in a year. Usually... Uh, when I do that, it starts off in Genesis, and there's these exciting stories about creation, and we've got stories like Noah's Ark, and then you get into Exodus, and there's more exciting stories about Moses rescuing the Israelites from Pharaoh, and the plagues, and the parting of the Red Sea, and then you get to Leviticus, and keeping up with that reading plan becomes difficult. It's certainly not a book that we read to our kids as bedtime stories. Um, but this, Jewish scholars thought, were, were mo the most important book for kids to learn. Now, this concept of holiness, one of the ways that, they, that you learned about God's holiness was this concept of clean and unclean. Clean and unclean. And so there's several chapters in this book that talk about, they give instructions to determine whether you are considered clean or unclean. Uh, for example, there's a long list of clean and unclean animals, animals that you could eat, and even animals that if you were to touch, you would be considered unclean. Uh, there's a whole discourse on skin diseases and mold. And then there's the, two, the TMI section, too much information section, on bodily discharges. And we won't go through that on Mother's Day. <laughs> but... As a person growing up in this culture, you would understand this thing. Unclean contaminates clean. The unclean contaminates the clean. If you have kids or grandkids, you're probably familiar with uh, the book series or the movies of Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And there's one movie called The Cheese Touch where uh, the main character, who's the wimpy kid, his name is Greg, um, he's talking with his best friend, Rowley, and they're on the playground. And while they're talking, they notice this piece of cheese on the blacktop. And Greg leans over to get a better look at the cheese. And as he's just about to touch the cheese, one of their friends uh, intervenes and stops him. He yells, stop. You almost got the cheese touch. Nobody knows when or how, but one day that cheese mysteriously appeared on the blacktop. Nobody knew who it belonged to, nobody touched it, nobody threw it away, and so there it sat, growing more powerful and foul by the day. 
Then one day, a kid named Darren Walsh made the biggest mistake of his life and touched it. Darren had the cheese touch. It was worse than nuclear cooties. He became an outcast. The only way to get rid of the cheese touch was by passing it on to someone else. And so began the cheese touch frenzy. Friend turning on friend. Brother turning on sister. It was madness. Until a German exchange student named Dieter Mueller took it away. Sadly for Dieter, the cheese touch was lost in translation. Thankfully, he moved back to Dusseldorf and took the cheese touch with him. And so the cheese sits, patiently waiting for its next victim. This is a terrible place. Now, the difference with the cheese touch in that story and this concept of clean and unclean is if you had the cheese touch, you could just pass it on to someone else and you no longer had the cheese touch. Uh, if you were considered unclean, you couldn't just touch someone else and pass it off. You were still unclean. There was, there was certain things that you had to do to be considered clean again. Uh, there were three things, in fact. Uh, one of them had to do with time or isolation. And so depending on how unclean you were considered, you would have to have a certain period of time before you would be considered clean again. In some cases, it was just for the day. At, at evening, you would be considered clean again. In some cases, it would be for a week. Uh, in other cases, it could be as long as 40 or 80 days that you would be unclean. And in terms of leprosy, you would be unclean until you were cured. Um, and and while, you were, while you had this sort of time out, while you were unclean, you were isolated from your community. And you might have to be outside of camp. And they even had instructions based on wind, how much wind there was, how close you could be to someone who was unclean. If there was no wind, then you could be within six feet of, a, of an unclean person. If there was wind, you would have to be up to 150 feet away from that person. And I can imagine just how, how people would use that wind rule, right? If there was someone who was unclean, who you weren't especially fond of, you might be like, oh, it's awfully windy today, isn't it? And they'd be like, oh, there's, there's no wind at all. Oh, it's windy, trust me, stay back. Um, that's, that's how that would work. Um, but could you imagine if we had this kind of framework today, if we applied this framework today? You know, so after service, you head out into the lobby, you're catching up with friends, and you're like, where's Greg? Oh, he touched a dead animal, unclean. He'll be back next week, though. Um, so that would be just bizarre for us, right? And you'd be very cautious about who you shake hands with. Um, it would just be bizarre. The truth is, I think we have a similar framework, and it's actually more similar to what this culture grew up with than we realize. And I want, I want to take a look at that this morning. So the system we have is in a system that, that was put upon us, like the Levites. This is a system that we've placed upon ourselves. And so the first thing that's similar, the first struggle that we have is our worth. We don't use words like clean or unclean. We use words like worthy and worthless. When we feel like we've done enough, given enough, been patient enough, accomplished enough, parented well enough, shown up enough, scored high enough, we give ourselves the label of worthy. But this label doesn't last long. That label easily gets replaced when we feel like we dropped the ball lost our cool, missed the mark, didn't meet someone's expectations, didn't meet our own expectations, fell short, or let someone down. And we don't simply have to fail at something to earn the label of worthless. We can earn this when we compare ourselves to someone else. If we think that someone else is worth more than us, or they've done something better than us, then we are worth less, and we give ourselves that label. So we're not clean and unclean. We're worthy and worthless. The second area that's similar, the second struggle, is isolation. Isolation. We don't clean ourselves with a ceremonial washing or a ritual washing, but we do try to clean up our own act, don't we? 
If I could just get this part of my life together, if I could just get a hold of this struggle that I have. Have you ever heard someone say, if I were to ever step foot in a church, lightning would strike me. It's this idea that we have to have our act together before we can come into community with others and with God. And until we're able to clean up our own act, we keep our distance from our friends and our family. We won't show our true selves. And we keep our distance from God. We isolate ourselves. And the third similarity, the third struggle we have is suffering. We don't bring an animal to sacrifice, but there are other ways that we can sacrifice. If I'm willing to pay this price, maybe they'll let me back in. If I beat myself up enough, if I suffer enough, then maybe that will offset what I've done. I was talking about this concept with a friend of mine, and he shared with me that when he was in elementary school, uh, one of the things he would do whenever he felt like he did something that he, he felt guilty about or shameful about is during gym class, when they were playing a game like dodgeball, he would just call himself out of the game. Even when he didn't get hit by a ball or someone caught his ball. They're, they're in the middle of a game, dodgeballs are flying back and forth, and he'd just be like, I'm out, and go sit down as sort of a punishment for these other things that he did. And that's what we do to ourselves. We punish ourselves. We, we, have, we feel like we have to suffer for what we've done. And the problem is actually worse than you think. And now you're thinking, oh, this, this is a wonderful Mother's Day message. Thank you. Uh, but tell your neighbor, don't worry, stick with me. But there's great risk to becoming unclean or unworthy. There's great risk to that. And so, how do you protect yourself? You stay away from anything unclean. Anything that could possibly contaminate you. There's a, a pastor and an author, Paul David Tripp, and he talks about this idea of monasteries in one of his books, where in Western Europe, between the 6th century and the 11th century, monasteries popped up all over the place. And so... The idea was that there's this, all this evil out there, and if we could just create this community and surround ourselves by a big wall around us, we can protect ourselves. And so that's what they did. But before long, the same problems that they struggled with outside started popping up in small ways and in big ways inside the monasteries. So why did this happen? The biggest problem with monasteries is that they let people into them. <laughs> because the problem is inside of us. It's a sin problem. Culture isn't the problem. People are. So does this mean that we should never try to protect ourselves, never try to uh, protect our kids? Uh, not at all. We, we want to continue to seek God's wisdom on what's best for ourselves and what's best for our families. But when we put our focus on the culture, we live in fear. When we understand that the problem is our sin, then we can allow Christ to transform us. So let's go back to the story of the leper, because I believe that the healing is a bigger deal than you think. So the leper grew up understanding this concept of the unclean contaminates the clean. But Jesus completely changes all of that. For the very first time, clean touches the unclean and clean contaminates the unclean. The leper becomes healed. And here's what you need to know. Clean can contaminate the unclean. Light is stronger than dark. Good overcomes evil. And when you live out your faith in light of that, it changes everything. No longer do you have to live in fear of the world, but we become world changers. And guess what? This is exactly what our vision is for our kids' ministry. 
We don't bring all of our kids here together on a Sunday morning so that they can just get an hour break from the world, that they can just kind of catch their breath for a minute and be protected. We bring our kids here so that we can invest in them, so that we can deposit God's truth into their life, so that they can find their identity in Christ, so that they can find hope and assurance in Him. And then when they go out, they're empowered to become world changers. There's a prophet in the Old Testament named Ezekiel, and he shares this vision that he has one day when he, in his vision, he stands before the temple. And remember, the temple in, in Leviticus time, this is, this is where you would have to be clean or pure to be able to come into the temple. But Ezekiel has this vision where water is trickling out of the temple, and it becomes a stream. And it turns into this deep river flowing through the desert, leaving behind it a trail of trees. And it continues to flow into the Dead Sea where nothing normally grows. And when it gets there, it just makes everything fresh and alive, bringing life. And and that's the same vision that we have for our kids. We have this opportunity to deposit living water into them here in our church and in our homes so that as they go out, wherever they go, they bring life and they make everything fresh and new and they contaminate the world around them with God's grace. That's why we do things like Flower City Work Camp and our student ministry sends teens out into the city because let's face it, they're in homes that aren't as safe as our own homes. But we know they're going to make a change around them. Their vision is to, so that the city might see Jesus. And it's worth the risk. So it's not about trying to feel or trying hard enough to feel worthy until the next struggle, struggle comes along and we apply that label of worthless again. It's not about isolating or hiding yourself until you're able to clean up your act. It's not about suffering enough or sacrificing enough until we might feel like we paid a big enough penalty. And it's not about trying to keep everything out that might be unclean. It's about inviting someone in. Christ says we are worthy because we are his. We are his workmanship. He paid for our sins on the cross so that we could be washed. And it's not my suffering, but it's his suffering that allows us to come into his presence. Would you bow your heads with me? I'd like to say that the results will always be as instant as they were when Jesus healed the leper. Where a single touch of clean instantly changes everything. But in my experience, it usually takes a lot longer to see clean contaminate unclean. It takes time, and that can be frustrating. But it's not so much about time. It's about trust. You might be in a season right now where it feels like clean is moving way too slow, or maybe clean is not moving at all. It's Mother's Day, Mother's Day today, and maybe we have some moms in the room who are waiting for their kids to move from what feels like unclean to clean. Maybe you're in a situation that you've been praying over and over and over again for, and nothing seems to happen. You're waiting for your son or daughter to finally meet Christ and follow after him in a way that transforms their life. Maybe you've been planting seeds of prayer every day and you just aren't seeing any fruit. There is a point in Mary's life, the mother of Jesus, where she stood and saw her son's lifeless body hanging on a cross. All hope was gone. It seemed as if unclean had won. 
and his body was taken down and all hope was gone. And then three days later, Christ appeared, risen from the dead. Mary saw her son again, her son who conquered the grave. Maybe your story isn't yet finished. Maybe Christ is still at work contaminating the unclean. There's something you need to hear. We aren't the ones who get to say, it is finished. It's Christ who says, it is finished. So Father, we're tired of living in fear. We're tired of falling into an old system that requires us to live isolated, feeling worthless, and suffering. We thank you that your son came and changed all of that. Unclean became clean. And we desire for your living water to live inside of us and to flow out of us. We trust in you and declare that we are no longer slaves to fear. Amen. Would you please stand with me? You rescued me so I 